again, I, I welcome those who are uh, auditors of the uh, Wednesday night class. Uh, we are in the study of Romans. And we uh, concluded with Romans, the ninth chapter, verse 3 last week. So we'll start with the fourth verse of chapter 9 this week. But before we do, let's have a short word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be here, to be able to engage in this study of thy word. And, and for the knowledge that we gained from that study, we realize the better that we understand thy will for us, that we would be more pleasing to thee, and that we would be better servants of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So bless this study and uh, all our private studies of thy word, that we may gain the uh, uh, knowledge and the purpose intended therein. For this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Uh, let me start up with uh, verse 3, because it's uh, since it's split in the middle there. It said, For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh. And last we said that Paul clearly uh, considered them unbelieving Jews as a curse that, uh, that is condemned and banished from the presence of God forever. But he just doesn't uh, say it out right, at least not yet. <clears throat> He's developing his point. Because of his affection for his countrymen, he could wish, but really no one wishes that for themselves. He can wish that he was accursed from Christ in their stead. And for it possible for him to be accursed so that they may be justified, which it is not, you can't be a uh, substitute for someone else and they have to stand on their own. Uh, that would do him no good and it still would not bring his kinsmen to Christ. Uh, this says something about Paul's in view of the persecution he endured at the hands of his countrymen. So he had a very uh, deep uh, concern for his people. To my countrymen, according to flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of law, the service of God, and the promises. Now, the Israelites are his countrymen, according to the flesh. Israel was the name given to Jacob by the angel with whom he wrestled. The name passed to his descendants, uh, which the Jew considered an honor to be called. The adoption uh, pertaining to the Israelite was quite quite different uh, to the adoption pertaining to the Christian. The former implied no renewal of the inner man, but merely the distinction of being one of God's chosen people in the flesh. Now, the latter is uh, predicated on regeneration. Now, adoption to an Israelite was surely national, not individual. And therefore, uh, there's no guarantee uh, of salvation. The Israelite had to add adoption in Christ, as did the Gentile. Otherwise, he was lost. <clears throat> the glory could be the divine honor of uh, being given God's chosen people. But it could have reference to the Shekinah. That's the glorious symbol of the divine presence. And Shekinah is uh, defined in Smith's Bible Dictionary as a, as a dwelling. The, the term itself is not found in the Bible. It was used by the latter Jews and borrowed by Christians from them to express the visible majesty, majesty of the divine presence, especially when resting or dwelling between the cherubim on the mercy seat. In the tabernacle and in the temple of Solomon, but not in the second temple, uh, the use of the term is first found in the Targums, and you'll have to look all that up, where it forms a frequent uh, uh, periphrasis, uh, we would call that a paraphrase, 
it's a frequent uh, periphrasis uh, for God, considering it uh, considered its dwelling among the children of Israel. The idea which the uh, different accounts in Scripture convey is that of a most brilliant and glorious light enveloped in a cloud and usually concealed by the cloud so that the cloud itself was for the most part alone visible but on particular occasions the glory appeared the allusions in the new testament to the shekinah are not infrequent uh, you got luke 2 verse 9 john 1 verse 14 romans 9 verse 4 and we are distinctly taught to connect it with the incarnation and future coming of the Messiah as a type with an antitype. Now, the, the covenants mentioned in this uh, uh, verse that we're considering are those which made were made uh, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, especially as it relates to the Messiah. Uh, the giving of the law includes the giving of the law at Sinai. Uh, the service to God refers to the whole Levitical system, and the promise is are those relating to Christ and the uh, gospel. In verse 5, it says, Of whom the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. Of his uh, countrymen in the flesh, now the fathers are their ancestors, distinguished men such as Abraham through David, through whom Christ, uh, outer man, his fleshly uh, nature was descended. Therefore, the Christ is just like them in the flesh, but is God in the spirit. <clears throat> the phrase, the eternally blessed God, may also be translated, God be blessed forever, depending on where the punctuation is placed. Both the King James Version and the American Standard translated uh, God blessed forever because of the placement of the comma by the translators. Of course, the Greek has no commas. Uh, regardless, Christ is now over all things. <clears throat> In uh, Romans, the ninth chapter, verse 6, we have the word of God is... It includes that all that God has promised regarding the salvation of man, including Jew and Gentile. The condition of fleshly Israel is implied in verses 1 through 5, but not explicitly stated. Uh, that is, that fleshly Israel had rejected the Christ. That did not, however, mean that God's word has failed. It never contemplated the whole of Israel since only a remnant was ever expected to be saved. Therefore, the word has had its in, intended effect. For not all are of Israel. Its confirmation that God's word of promise has not failed. The physical offspring of Israel do not comprise all spiritual Israel, as used in the promises included in the phrase, word of God. The true Israel have accepted Christ as a promise embrace embrace no others. Therefore, the promise has been strictly kept. In verse 7 of chapter 9, it says, Nor are they all children, because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. Now, the same idea uh, as expressed in the uh, verse 6, so it's kind of a repetition. They are children only within the scope of a promise, that is, the, the word of God. His word of promise no more includes all of Abraham's seed now, as he was writing the letter to this, than it did then. Isaac and Ishmael were both the seed of Abraham, but Isaac was accepted and Ishmael, Ishmael was rejected. So now his word of promise to bless includes only those who believe in the Christ and obey his will. Some he has already blessed, so his word has not failed. 
he accepts those who believe in Christ, Jew and Gentile, just as he chose the children of Isaac, and reject those who do not accept Christ as a savior, as he rejected the children of, of Ishmael. None of this is a failure of his word. In verse eight, it says, that is those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. This is a further explanation of the preceding verses and then draws a deduction. The children of the flesh only were not in the past accepted by God as his children children merely because they were the seed of Abraham. As is the case of Ishmael, they were cast out. But the children of promise, as in the case of Isaac, <coughs> were chosen as his children. Then because they were his peculiar people, and now because they have been regenerated by the blood of Christ. To be born of the flesh is no ground for acceptance by God. A different birth is needed. The children of Isaac alone were the children of the promise, and they alone were chosen. Not only uh, those who render, render obedience to Christ are the children of the promise, and they are counted as the seed of Abraham. All others, no matter their ancestry, will be rejected. No failure of the word. In verse 9, it says, For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. The promise was made in uh, Genesis 18, chapter verse 10. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your son will, shall have a son. In verse 10 of chapter 9, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac. <clears throat> it was said to her, uh, verse 12, uh, if the parenthetical of verse 11 is ignored. <clears throat> not only in the case of Abraham were the children of promise counted as children, but also in the case of Isaac, this uh, further confirms that the children of promise are counted as children. And here's the parenthetical for the children not yet being born, not having done any good or evil, that the purpose, purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. <clears throat> <clears throat> Before Jacob and Esau were born, and Therefore, at that time, we're incapable of any good or evil. He caused it to be said to Rebecca, <clears throat> the older shall serve the younger. This indicated his choice of Jacob and constituted a promise to him. The quote unquote, according to election, uh, merely is God's right to choose. His choice is not based on a previous election, but rather it is the purpose of God in making choices. <clears throat> the reason for the choice is according to his purpose. It has nothing to do with anything that men do, but everything to do with God's own will and the choosing. He chose Jacob rather than Esau, which was in harmony with his absolute right and purpose of choice that is unconditioned on human acts. The choice is not based on the works of man, but on him who calls. God's choosing had no determination uh, on the final destiny of Jacob or Esau. God's choosing left each to, as free to pursue those things that would save him and to shun those things that would condemn him. What men willfully do, not in God's choosing according to his purpose, determines their, their salvation or doom. <clears throat> God's choosing did render the outward temporal circumstances of Jacob far superior to those of Esau, but it also increased obligations 
and responsibilities that left them equals in salvation. <clears throat> Verse 12 of chapter 9, and it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. <clears throat> uh, considering verse 13, which we'll get to shortly, this is clearly regarded by Paul as referring to Esau and Jacob. <clears throat> Esau, the older, was rejected as a child of promise, whereas Jacob, the younger, was a child of promise. And you might... Uh, Look at the uh, comments that we've made previously. <clears throat> in verse 13, uh, it reads, As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. In Malachi, the first chapter, verses 2 and 3, it reads there, I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, In what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Says the Lord. And Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. <clears throat> God loved Jacob in that he preferred him to his brother. The extent to which he hated Esau was in, was in rejecting him for being one of the heads of his people. In verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. <clears throat> what can be said to rebut the foregoing? If there is something that has been said which is untrue or open to objection, what is it? Paul raises a question before some objector raises it. So he could uh, dismiss it from their thought. At least he answers an anticipated question before they could raise it. And the answer is an emph emphatic no. In verse 15, where he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. God said to, to Moses, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Exodus, the 33rd chapter, verse 19. <clears throat> well, why is this? Uh, because he sees fit to have mercy on no one unless it is within itself absolutely right. He acted on this uh, principle in the case of Isaac and Ishmael and Jacob and Esau. He chose Isaac, Isaac and Jacob because it was right. In choosing Isaac, he worked no ill uh, whatever to Ishmael. His choice of Isaac had no more effect on Ishmael than if no choice had been made. God did not curse Ishmael or become his enemy. He chose Isaac, nothing more. It was the same with Jacob and Esau. In choosing the former, he did no injustice to the latter. God, in choosing uh, Jacob, did not depress uh, Esau, who was unaffected by the choice, uh, or by the choice he made as though Jacob had never existed. There is no injustice with God. Verse 16. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. The it, as used here, is the choosing of the previous verse. The so is illative, and that, that just means it has the nature of a uh, stating an inference. The so is illative. The inference is from the declaration to Moses. God's act of choosing is not dependent on a will or wish to be chosen, nor what exertions are made to secure the choice. It is God who does the choosing, 
and he makes his choice independent of human volition or action. God is clearly the, the one making the choice. But how does his choice show mercy, say, to Ishmael and I, Esau? His choices result in mere temporal ends and temporal distinctions. His choosing Isaac and Jacob did not assure them of salvation, nor did it assign Ishmael and Esau to perdition. Salvation and perdition are settled by what the parties to the choice do. When God makes a choice, it is a mercy to be chosen. Uh, it is a mercy to the chosen and to the rejected. The mercy to one is a mercy to all. Therefore, the choice of Isaac and Jacob was best for Ishmael and Esau and their posterity alike. In uh, verse 17, it comments uh, a little long. So we'll stop here uh, with verse 17 and start it uh, next week. Thank you for your kind attention.